three concerning foreign election interference. Before we smart start, a reminder that all comments should be addressed through the chair. The clerk and I will maintain consolidated speaking lists of members wishing to speak. For the first hour, we have with us today from 3 to 4 p.m. from the Privy Council Office, Jody Tom Thomas, National Security Intelligence Advisor from the Department of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Development, Cindy Termo Sizen, uh, Associate Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, and from the Department of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness, Sean Tupper, Deputy Minister. Um, I just see Mr. Cooper would like the floor real quick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a very brief housekeeping matter. I would note that house resources are available up until 11 p.m. this evening, and uh, given that we have uh, two hours with witnesses, uh, it is my intent to move our conservative motion that was put on notice that, among other things, calls for Katie Telford to testify before this committee, testimony that is essential to get to the heart of what is at issue, and that is, what did the Prime Minister know, when did he know it, and what did he do or fail to do about Beijing's election interference? And on that basis, Madam Chair, respectfully, I, I just wish to indicate that you do not have the implied consent of the official opposition to adjourn at 5 p.m. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. So you're not moving your motion at this time? At 5 p.m. You will plan to move it at 5 p.m.? Yes. Or, or when we're done with the panel. The second panel. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. So I believe we will now resume with our witnesses who have so kindly joined us today. Mrs. Thomas, you will be providing opening remarks, and we welcome them now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for the opportunity to appear today with my colleagues. Mes collègues et moi appuyons les efforts du comité pour étudier les questions de l'ingérence étrangère au Canada. It is very important. Savoir si on l'interprète peut monter. Yes, can you hear the interpreter? Can people hear the interpreter? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, for the opportunity to appear today with my colleagues. My colleagues and I support the committee's efforts to study foreign interference within Canada. It is very important to reassure Canadians that the last two federal elections were fair and legitimate. Canadians have questions about foreign interference attempts during the last elections, and we will endeavour to answer those questions in the most transparent way possible within the limits of the law. We as national security officials have a duty to protect classified information. An authorized sharing of classified information is in fact prohibited by the Security of Information Act. That is not to say that we cannot or should not talk about foreign interference, which is not a new phenomena, nor is it unique to Canada. Like others, we believe this threat is on the rise and increasingly complex. The greatest foreign interference threat to Canada comes from the People's Republic of China, though other states like Russia and Iran are also attempting to covert covertly or coercively interfere in our affairs. As highlighted in many public reports, including from CESA's and the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians, foreign interference takes on many forms, such as undue pressure on politicians, staff and public servants to obtain information or sway decisions. Intimidation of diasporas or other communities, including, for example, by denying visas to visit family. Mis- or disinformation to weaken Canada's societal cohesion. We have seen this play out in the context of Canada's support to Ukraine. Encroachments into our territory or networks for intelligence collection. Theft of our science, data and research. Measuring the short and long-term impacts of foreign interference is a challenge. We know that it costs Canada tens of billions of dollars annually in lost profitability, erodes Canadian technological advantages, particularly in emerging technologies, undermines national unity and sows discontent, threatens the safety of targeted individuals and their entourage or families, and challenges democracy. 
Over the past few years, we have taken a number of steps to more effectively detect, deter, and counter foreign interference in all of its forms, including, but not only, during election periods. One effective way to do so is to talk about the threat and how we mitigate it without jeopardizing the sources and techniques used to gather intelligence and keep Canadians safe. As I said, one of our responsibilities as senior officials of the security and intelligence community is to be as transparent as possible without further challenging national security or further damaging trust in our democratic institutions. As such, we have been engaging with communities, academia, industry and politicians to raise awareness and provide tools to help address this broad, complex threat. Such tools include the Security and Intelligence Threats to Election Task Force and the Critical Election Incident Public Protocol. These mechanisms helped ensure that the 2019 and 2021 federal elections were indeed fair and legitimate, despite foreign interference attempts. As described by Minister Blair in a December 2020 letter to Members of Parliament, our broader Counter Foreign Int Interference Toolkit also includes countering mis- and disinformation, including using active cyber tools and leading the G7 rapid response mechanism, enhancing research security, including with guidance to research granting councils, protecting our networks from malicious actors, including through the creation of the Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity, investigating, disrupting and or prosecuting foreign interference activity. We cannot paint an overly optimistic picture. Things change, tools and methods change. Our adversaries adapt quickly and find innovative ways to interfere in our affairs. And so we must continue to learn, including from one election to the next, to refine our collective defences and adapt to this evolving threat. Part of this is better informing Canadians of the threats we face. I will stress again that this must be done responsibly without putting at risk the physical safety of our human resources, our human sources and employees by publicly divulging classified material. Given the very nature of intelligence, individual reports, when taken out of context, may be incomplete and misrepresentative of the full story. We must also carefully consider that, as recently suggested by Senator Shugart, in some cases, publicly disclosing intelligence on foreign states' specific attempts to interfere may ultimately play into their hands, including by potentially affecting outcomes of electoral processes and creating confusion. To conclude, while I was not in my current role in 2019 or 2021, I speak for the security and intelligence community when I say that we are clear-eyed in understanding the challenge posed by foreign interference. We are taking concrete steps to strengthen our counter-foreign interference approach, including by making sure that those who engage in such activities face consequences. Again, as Minister Blair stated in his letter to members of Parliament, we cannot always make government actions public in this sphere. Our sustained efforts make a difference in the lives of Canadians. Once again, thank you. My colleagues and I will be pleased to answer your questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. We'll now go into our question round, starting with six minutes, starting with Mr. Cooper, followed by Mr. Fergus, suivi par Madame Normandin, et puis Mr. Followed by Mr. No Madame Normandin, and then Mr. Julian. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Thomas, and to all of the witnesses for making yourself available uh, this afternoon. Um, I'll direct my questions to Ms. Thomas. On February 24, 2023, Sam Cooper of Global News reported that three weeks before the 2019 election, CSIS officials gave an urgent briefing to senior aides in the Prime Minister's office warning them that a then Liberal candidate, who is now a sitting Liberal MP, had received assistance from Beijing's Toronto consulate in his nomination campaign. On what date was the Prime Minister briefed about this? As I stated, I was not in this job in 2019. Uh, and so I do not know when the Prime Minister was briefed. And, and I realize you were not in that job, but would you undertake to confirm the date that the Prime Minister was briefed? about that? Uh, I will certainly do that and as you're aware the director of CSIS will be here uh, at this Thank committee. you so you will undertake to yes. do that. Thank you very much. What are the names 
of the senior aides in the Prime Minister's office who were briefed by CSIS about Beijing's interference to help this then Liberal candidate and now sitting Liberal MP. I, again, I was not at that briefing. So speculating on who was briefed, uh, CSIS will be here and they'll be able to answer that question for you. So will you undertake, given that you are the National mm -hmm. Security Advisor to the Prime Minister, to provide the committee with the names of senior aides in the Prime Minister's office, as reported by Global News, who were briefed by CSIS? Uh, I will undertake to uh, report the names of who was briefed as informed to me by CSIS. Robert Fife and Stephen Chase, in a February 17, 2023 article in the Globe and Mail, reported that the Prime Minister received a national security briefing last fall in which he was told that uh, Beijing's consulate uh, in Toronto uh, was involved with assisting 11 candidates in the 2019 election. On what date was the Prime Minister briefed about this? I don't have my calendar in front of me. Well, I will give you that date. You will undertake to provide yes. that date. Thank you very much. On uh, November 7th, 2022, Sam Cooper of Global News reported that the Prime Minister and several Cabinet Ministers received a series of briefings and memos about Beijing's efforts to subvert Canada's democratic process, including interfering in the 2019 election. Uh, can you confirm that the Prime Minister was briefed about this? The Prime Minister is briefed quite continuously on foreign interference. I asked a very specific question. And that was in regards to what Sam Cooper reported on November 7, 2022. Was the Prime Minister briefed? Um, what is the date you're asking about his briefing? You're telling me the date of the report, not the date of the briefing. Uh, that began in January of 2022. Um, since January 2022, I will give you the dates. When we've briefed the Prime Minister formally, we also have informal discussions with him frequently about foreign interference and the activities in the national security so, community. So put it this way, will you undertake to provide the dates that the Prime Minister was briefed uh, with, it, with respect to Sam Cooper's report of November 7, 2022? Uh, I can't give you the dates that the Prime Minister was briefed about media reports. I can tell you the dates he was briefed about foreign interference. Okay. So uh, w with that, how many times was the Prime Minister briefed about Beijing's interference in the 2019 and 2021 elections? Uh, the Prime Minister would have been briefed on foreign interference in the elections multiple times between 2019 and 2021 and 2022. Uh, we will endeavour to get you those dates. Can you, so you will undertake to provide the dates and the agencies and those involved in briefing Prime Minister. We will uh, endeavour to get the dates for Every you. Every instance that he was briefed in respect of Beijing's election interference. I will do my best. But again, I was not in this job at the time. Okay. Um, a redacted report uh, entitled uh, Daily Foreign Intelligence Brief dated February 21st, 2020 from the Intelligence Assessment Secretariat at PCO provided to this committee in the production process states that there were, quote, subtle but effective interference networks, end of quote, by Beijing in the 2019 election and provides the following assessment, quote, investigations into activities linked to the Canadian federal election in 2019 reveal an active foreign interference network uh, end of quote. On what date was the, the what date did, on what date did the PCO share this information with the Prime Minister? That information is widely circul circulated and is available in daily reading packages. And, and it, the Prime Minister would have received that. It would have been in a daily reading package. And uh, would any ministers have received that? Uh, in all likelihood, yes. Thank you. Mr. Fergus.
Mr. Fergus, thank you, Madam Chair. Here today. To the, can you briefly describe what foreign interference means to the national security and intelligence agencies? And, you know, because here we're talking about electoral interference, but I'm certain the definition is larger than that, that it deals with academia, businesses, uh, and other aspects of society. Can you briefly outline what foreign interference means to your community? I'm happy to. Mr. Tupper is responsible, the Deputy Minister responsible for the agency, so perhaps he would like to weigh in. It's a great question because it is a complex web of activity. Uh, we take very much a whole of society approach to looking at foreign interference. Uh, you, you noted a, a number of areas that we look at, democratic institutions. Uh, we look at particular communities uh, within the country uh, to uh, ensure we have an understanding of what's going on and the kind of interference that may be occurring in diaspora communities. Uh, we pay attention to economic and national security issues in terms of attempts to disrupt our, our economy. Um, so that might be looking at, at, at banks and, and the rules and regulations that surround and protect uh, our financial institutions. Certainly on the international affairs side, uh, we would have fairly comprehensive reporting and, 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 and awareness of, of our activities uh, and our partnerships with our allies to uh, jointly work uh, together. And then finally, we pay an inordinate amount of uh, attention to our critical infrastructure. Uh, the disruption of our grids, of our pipelines, would have massive disruption in our communities, so we pay a lot of attention to that. Thank you. Is, is it fair to say that uh, foreign interference is not new? And are, have governments taken steps towards this? Are they taking steps towards this? What uh, are the national security agencies involved in that process and, uh, to try to combat foreign interference? It's absolutely fair to say it's not new. Um, I, I, how, think, I think that the how shift long that... Has, has, how long would you say that national as, security... As long as governments have opposed one another, I would, I, I would offer. I, I think the real shift, though, uh, has occurred in the last five or six years. And I, and I think uh, the more typical uh, activities of espionage, of, of, of uh, you know, suitcases full of money, of, of coercion, um, those are things we've known about for a very long time. But over the last number of years, I think through the use of social media, the ability uh, to invoke uh, cyber attacks against states, uh, it has really escalated uh, our awareness and our attention to the area simply because it's more pervasive, it's more aggressive, and the potential for damage uh, to our democracy is, is that much more uh, serious. The social media has been around for a while. When did it first get onto your agenda? I, I think largely uh, post the 2016 American election, where we, we started to understand how foreign countries were trying to influence that uh, election, uh, I think it was a real learning point for us to understand uh, particularly what the Russians had been doing. Uh, so we have, have paid more and more attention since that time to really understand uh, and make sure that we have awareness of what's going on in Canada and the kinds of activities that are centered, uh, centered on the Canadian state. I want to talk about uh, some allegations that I've been able to read uh, from Walid uh, Suleiman, who has said publicly that he served as a Conservative Party's representative on the uh, site task force in 2021. He said allegations of foreign interference were brought forward as a part of the site task force engagement with political parties, but were not taken seriously. How do you respond to that? Uh, thank you very much for the question, Madam Chair. I um, I'm again was not on the the task force or the panel at that time. Uh, we do have uh, very clear documentation uh, from that representative of that political party um, asking questions and stating concerns with a, rel a very detailed response back to him um, on or about October 22nd, indicating that the 2021 that the uh, Allegations were being taken very seriously, but that we did not see um, the evidence that he presented in the intelligence to support the claims. Now, there have been claims since then, and we're reviewing that information to understand um, the full picture as broadly as is possible, but he was given a very thorough response at the time. Ms. Thomas, is there anything to suggest that the facts have changed since that original assessment was given? 
there is nothing, in response to his claims? There is nothing that suggests um, that the outcome um, and that the writings that he was concerned about were uh, affected by attempts at foreign interference. Uh, there certainly were attempts. We haven't denied that. But intelligence evolves and we get more information. We obtain more information. There's more sources um, that become available and we have to continuously assess the picture um, and our understanding of any given situation. And so information has come to light since that response was given and I've asked that we just review it and be able to understand and uh, answer questions about it. Uh, thank you. Um, were there other allegations which were brought forward at the time from other parties? Not that I am aware of, no. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Madame Normandin, bienvenue. Ms. Normandin, welcome. You have six minutes. Thank you. Ms. Thomas, earlier you m stated that you were not in your job at the time uh, when allegations about a, a liberal candidate uh, who had been helped by China, you were not there when those allegations came out, but you were there when uh, the Prime Minister said it was not the role of CSIS to determine who it should not be, who should and shouldn't be allowed to run. What does it, message does this send to those people wishing to interfere in the democratic system, who wish to imbalance a political party. This idea that CSIS information was uh, more or less put in a drawer, information about a problematic political candidate, what message does this send in terms of security? Does it give an impression that this issue is not as important as it is? Question, Madam Chair. Uh, I. Uh would suggest that that's not the conclusion I would draw. The conclusion I would draw is that uh, CSIS provides information, uh, they build an intelligence picture, uh, they investigate, and they provide information to decision makers up, into, up to and including the Prime Minister. I agree with the Prime Minister, CSIS does not determine who should be a candidate and who should not. They provide for all parties where there is a concern and if there is a concern, information that parties then use in their uh, nomination processes uh, for their own purpose and according to their own rules, regulations and bylaws that govern that party. Uh, CSIS provides information to decision makers. Thank you. The Prime Minister stated that he didn't, had not received uh, information about the allegations from CSIS, or rather that uh, there, he wouldn't confirm or deny. I want to talk about the fact that there were people who had information and provided it to the media. What message does this send in terms of national security? The fact that uh, some CSIS employees seem to be risking their very careers just to leak this information to the media. Is, is the message being sent that the Prime Minister didn't take it seriously enough in the first place? Uh, thank you very much for the question. It's a very important question. We in the public service are the guardians of protected information. Uh, we share information to those people who have security clearances or are in roles of uh, authority where they can make decisions. Uh, the unlawful sharing of information and the inappropriate sharing of information, I believe, um, jeopardizes our national security. It jeopardizes institutions and it puts people at risk, both employees and subjects of investigations at unnecessary risk uh, and it's very concerning. I'm not going to speculate on the motivations. It seems to be an essential question. This idea that uh, information was leaked to the media does this uh, not justify the need for a public inquiry, a more wide-ranging public inquiry, to examine uh, issues of interference uh, in depth? Inquiries like this one, I think, are very important in terms of understanding what happened, and so I applaud that you are doing this. I think it is important to talk about foreign interference. I think it's important to talk about the electoral process. 
Um, a public inquiry will have the same limitations that this committee does in that we cannot talk about national security information in a public fora. Uh, the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians was created for situations like this where we can be absolutely transparent with them and they can see the um, secret, top secret, protected information that was used to make decisions and to inform decision makers. And so I would... Um, if an inquiry were to happen, it is through a body like that that I would recommend because an open forum is going to have the same limitations that this body does. Au niveau de, uh, de l'impression que ça peut... Thinking of the impression that, that this could give, uh, the idea that this, the information release could cause a panic. How would you assess the fact that uh, people wishing to shine a light on a foreign interference which may have taken place during elections were, were accused of racism. Does this not create cynicism? A cynicism that could be countered through a public inquiry or through, through groups insured with uh, analyzing elections? Are we not contributing to cynicism? I think it's important to note that members of the Chinese community came out yesterday and said it is important to talk about this, uh, that the um, health and well-being of diaspora communities and mem Canadians from um, countries who participate in foreign interference feel protected as Canadians. And I think that is a really essential element of having a nation as multicultural as ours, is that uh, Canadians do feel equal and do feel protected by the national security community. Um, I think that is why the work that is being done on foreign interference is so important, because it does ultimately protect citizens. Merci, madame. Thank you. Six minutes for you. Mr. Julian, I see your lips moving, but I don't hear your voice. So do we want to try that again? You are on mute, but I don't hear you. Is it your headset that's muted? Is there buttons on your headset? There is not. Okay, that's interesting. Do you want to unplug it one time and plug it in again? We did do a sound check, correct? Huh. We did. There we go. It's a miracle. Excellent. Hearing and your voice Thanks to is good. our IT team. We did do a sound check. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to start off uh, by providing a notice of motion. This motion was circulated to committee yesterday uh, with 48-hour notice period. I would be moving it tomorrow. The notice of motion reads as following, that the committee report to the House that it calls on the Government of Canada to launch a national public inquiry into allegations of foreign interference in Canada's democratic system, including but not limited to allegations of interference in general elections by foreign governments. That this inquiry be granted all necessary powers to call witnesses from the government and from political parties, including but not limited to ministers, former ministers, chiefs of staff to the prime minister and to the leader of the official opposition during the 2019 and 2021 federal election campaigns, and national campaign directors for the 2019 and 2021 federal election campaigns of the Liberal Party of Canada and the Conservative Party of Canada. And that this inquiry have the power to order and review all documents it deems necessary for this work, including documents which are related to national security. Uh, I will be moving uh, that formally uh, tomorrow. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to go to our witnesses. Uh, Madame Thomas, uh, you, you stated that you weren't in a position uh, when uh, the events that have been described uh, happened, but you have been in your position, I'm sure, able to read the articles written by Robert Fife and Stephen Chase, uh, seen, of course, the reports by Sam Cooper on Global News. Will you acknowledge that uh, the allegations that are contained in those reports are factual? I'm not going to comment on um, information that was inappropriately obtained. Uh, the concept and the problem and the severity of foreign interference is well documented. 
uh, that there was attempts at foreign interference in the 2019 and 2021 federal elections has been documented and is quite transparent in the reports done by Jim Judd and Morris Rosenberg. Uh, and so I acknowledge that foreign interference has been attempted. Uh, if those allegations are correct, this constitutes criminal violations of the Elections Act, as we saw with the in and out scandal uh, back under the Harper government. Uh, Dean Del Mastro, of course, in his case as a Conservative MP. Uh, does your evaluation include criminal activity? Alors, quand on a un cas où il y a... So in cases where there are allegations of uh, breaches of election law, those are criminal allegations. And in those contexts, how do you respond? Uh, the RCMP form uh, a critical part of the team of, of, of people who assess um, activities during elections. Uh, they were aware of the information that was brought forward. They have looked at that information and have concluded that they will not pursue a criminal investigation. Uh, I know my colleagues from the RCMP will be appearing before this um, committee, so perhaps more detail on that can be uh, pursued with them. Uh, do you refer uh, any allegations of uh, violations of the Elections Act to the Commissioner of Elections? The Commissioner of Elections is an independent officer and indeed would pursue uh, in their own right uh, the ability to uh, look at allegations as they're brought forward. Uh, no, that's not my question. I mean, if, if, if there was criminal activity or there's allegations of criminal activity, the Commissioner of Elections uh, isn't necessarily going to be aware of that. Is that part of what you do in, in the case where these allegations uh, come forward? Indeed. Um, the RCMP would pursue those, those portions of allegations that, that, that fall under the, 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 the criminal law. Uh, there would be a conversation, indeed, between the RCMP and, and Elections Act uh, officials or the Commission officials uh, to uh, look at the corresponding violations that may occur under the Act uh, that they would be responsible for, indeed. So, so that is something that you do when, when these allegations arise. Uh, you, you do an investigation yourselves. Um, and potentially uh, you uh, uh, also referred to the Commissioner of Elections uh, for possible investigation. Yes. I, I want to ask you, uh, and I go back to Ms. Thomas, how do you evaluate the extent of, of foreign interference? And I'm speaking specifically in this case, uh, both of the Chinese government, but also the Russian government and Russian actors uh, that have been playing a major role, as we know, in disrupting uh, democracies, including the United Kingdom and the United States? Thank you very much. It's a very important question. Uh, we rely on the national security agencies, um, along with uh, the Canadian Forces Intelligence Command, the Foreign Intelligence Unit at Global Affairs Canada, uh, and allies to help us assess the depth and persistence of foreign interference in Canada. As we said, it's not new and it's not um, restricted or targeted on, in Canada in particular. Uh, we use a number of tools and tradecraft that certainly we're not going to discuss publicly, but the collection of intelligence and the analysis of that in intelligence in its totality, not the individual pieces, understanding the veracity of it, um, understanding whether it's reliable or not, understanding if there is um, conflicting or contradicting information helps build that picture. Certainly the activities of proxies play a role in that. Thank you. Uh, we will now continue with our um, the five minutes to Mr. Cooper, followed by Mr. Turnbull. I'll be splitting my time with Mr. Bertold. Excellent. Uh, Ms. Thomas, you said in answer to a question posed by Mr. Julian, but you would not be commenting on what you claimed were reports of information that were inappropriately obtained. I would remind you of Section 15 of the Security and Information Act, which provides that no person is guilty of an offense under Section 13 or 14 if the person establishes that he or she acted in the public interest. Are you saying that it was not in the public interest for the public to know 
about Beijing's interference in our elections in 2019 and 2021? Is that what you're telling this committee? That is not even close to what I'm telling this committee. Uh, we have talked about foreign interference attempts publicly. Uh, the directors of, director of CSIS has. The panel of five did. Jim Judd did. Morris Rosenberg did. You, but would you, would you, Ms. Thomas, agree that it is important to shine a light on issues of foreign interference? I would agree, uh, Madam Chair, I would agree absolutely that it's important to shine a light on matters of foreign interference. I thank think it's important much. to do thank it in a responsible now, manner. Uh, thank you. I have limited time, Mr. Bertold. So I'm just going to pause the clock. And do a friendly reminder, because perhaps since it is a constituency week, we're not remembering that when multiple people are speaking on the mic, it's difficult for interpretation. So as we are having a very important conversation, we do need to make sure that questions are posed and that provided a time to answer so that we can get this information. And I will continue being lenient with some time to make sure we have that time. So Mr. Berthold, à vous la parole. Mr. Berthold? You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Thomas, you said several times that you were not present in 2019 nor 2020, that you recently assumed this, uh, this position. So did you receive a transition book from your predecessor? In fact, I did not receive a transition book from my predecessor. However, uh, I had individual meetings with all the heads of the security agencies and my colleague deputy ministers. Okay. Uh, the so since you've been in this position, have you been made aware of certain information that was reported in the uh, Sean Cooper's uh, article in November 7th, 2022, before it became public? I've read significant amount of intelligence about foreign interference in Canada. Um, and some of the information I've read goes back and is dated in 2018, 2019. Did you share that information directly with the Prime Minister? I did not share information with the Prime Minister uh, independently of incidents that occurred before I was here in this job. Did you discuss these incidents since then with the Prime Minister? Uh, while I'm not going to reveal what I have discussed with the Prime Minister, we have had very detailed and thorough conversations on foreign interference. Qui, qui participe Who participates in this type of meeting? Uh, there are a range of people, certainly people on his immediate staff, members of the national security community, uh, and often the clerk of the Privy Council. Is it possible for you to send us a list of the people who participate in these briefings on, for, in, on foreign interference? I can give you general lists, yes. Vous avez aussi you also mentioned earlier that several ministers were informed through these uh, daily briefings concerning foreign interference. Could you please tell us which ministers participate in these types of briefings? What, what I said was that the daily foreign intelligence bulletin that was referenced in a previous question um, is distributed broadly uh, to those who have clearance to read and it is provided to some ministers. Has it ever happened? for you to have discussions with the Prime Minister and other Cabinet members with respect to these daily briefings on the subject of the Chinese foreign, foreign interference? Uh, the daily foreign intelligence briefing is an assessed piece that gives highlights of what's going on in terms of foreign interference on a range of subjects. Uh, I don't normally use it as a basis for briefing. Uh, normally I use, uh, and it's not necessarily me briefing, um, the Briefing material generally comes directly from the National Security Agency than, rather than the assessed piece. Mais est -ce que parfois... But sometimes during your briefings with the Prime Minister, are other cabinet members participating in these briefings? Uh, on, there are a range of briefings, but... Uh, ben, sur, particulièrement sur le sujet. Especially on the topic that's uh, at hand today. Unless it is a discussion in cabinet or a cabinet committee, the briefings are with the Prime Minister. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. I could ask you the same questions as to information for Sam Cooper's uh, Global News and Global News is, uh, reporting, uh, as well as Robert Fife and Stephen Chase from s February 17th. I imagine that you will respond that in s several re you've received information in several reports. Thank, Thank you. Mr. Turnbull, up to five minutes for you. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks to our witnesses for being here today. Uh, Ms. Thomas, I'm going to focus on some short answer uh, questions to you, so I hope you can keep your, uh, your answers short, um, if possible. We've seen a number of concerning allegations over the recent weeks with all the reporting that's been going on. So I want to get a very clear answer to this important question. Do you agree that if CSIS, through its intelligence gathering, becomes aware of illegal activity, that information should be referred to relevant authorities for further investigation? The simple answer to that question is yes. Um, Perfect. Thank you. Uh, and there were, I want to follow that up with some specific examples in, in the media reporting. There were reports that CSIS allegedly became aware of instances where the difference between the original political donation and the refund a person gets at tax time was returned to donors. So first, would you agree that that constitutes an illegal activity? Uh, that report was uh, uh, in the media. Um, of course, the intelligence that backs it up is more complex than is probably um, evident in the single clip or um, piece of that report that's been revealed in the media. If there is a concern about criminal activity, the RCMP receives the intelligence. They are responsible for determining what they will investigate and what they will pursue. As you're very well aware, police independence is a critical element of uh, Canadian law enforcement and our judicial system. So my understanding is that that, that would be an illegal activity if, it, if those allegations were true. And CSIS would then be required to refer their intelligence to the RCMP and the Commissioner of Elections uh, or both through either the site task force or otherwise. Is that not true? Uh, there are many ways that CSIS could refer information. They work very closely with the RCMP and they have a number of mechanisms to ensure the RCMP receives intelligence for their own purposes and when they have a complete enough picture to refer to the RCMP. Okay, great. And so would if charges were laid, obviously that would become public, would it not? Th there's a lot of process before charges are laid, but yes. If charges were yep. laid, if there were an investigation, yes. Thank you. And Mr. Tupper, I wonder, wondered if you could comment on the next question, which is, do you know if the RCMP received information from CSIS on this particular allegation around political donations? And is the RCMP investigating any matters regarding foreign interference from the last election? I can confirm that the RCMP is not investigating any of the allegations uh, that are arising from the last election on the specifics of the question of, of, of your, the first part of your question, I will endeavor to come back because I don't have specifics on that. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. So with regards to another CSIS uh, or another report that CSIS allegedly found that business owners hired international Chinese students and assigned them to volunteer in election campaigns on a full-time basis. I'm, I want to ask the same question. So would you agree that this would be constitute or would be an illegal activity? So uh, Ms. Uh, Thomas, to you. I can't say that that would be an illegal activity. Um, and I would have to have more information. And certainly I'm not the arbiter of what's illegal. Sure, okay. Well, I, I, I myself can confirm or feel very strongly that this would constitute an illegal activity if it were true. And if so, uh, if there was evidence to suggest that that's true and intelligence, then CSIS and CSIS became aware of that illegal activity, then it should obviously, as per our previous uh, lines of questioning, would have to turn that information over uh, to appropriate authorities. Is that not true? In, in a simple world, the answer is yes. However, uh, one single piece of intelligence, um, depending on how uh, uh, credible the intelligence is, multiple source reporting, there's a lot that goes into change, uh, the, the translation of intelligence into evidence. It's a critical problem. Um, often the information that CSIS obtains can't be used for criminal charges because it is not intelligence or criminal investigation because it's not evidence, I apologize. Uh, and often, 
um, to proceed with from intelligence to evidence means a re, uh, it would reveal sources or tradecraft that would be problematic and other decisions are made in terms of how um, that uh, information will be dealt with. Thank you. But it, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank, thank you. you. Madame Normandin. Ms. Normandin, you have two and a half minutes. Thank you. I'd like to come back to the information we received about support for a liberal candidate through Chinese authorities. Can this be considered as interference, yes or no? I think certainly it would be, if it was covert, um, diplomats around the world, as an example, do have lists of politicians who are friendly to Canada, as an example. We do the same thing. When it becomes covert, not overt, not diplomacy, but uh, behind the scenes machinations and perhaps malevolent, yes. I'll just interrupt you, since that's already been covered. What about donations through uh, third parties? Uh, are, is that, can, can that be considered interference? Again, if it is not in keeping with Canadian law, yes. Merci. Thank you. The information we received from the media can uh, can constitute sources of interference. So I would like to know whether it was discussed that that information be made public before we heard about it through the media. Uh, again, that intelligence um, would likely not be made public for the reasons I have cited previously, but the discussion about foreign interference and the attempts at foreign interference to affect the election have been discussed publicly. Not Thank you. Insofar as we know that the Chinese Communist Party exerts great pressure on the diaspora to achieve certain results, I would like to know if we don't make infer interference information public, how can we protect the Chinese diaspora here, which is being threatened and pressured uh, with threats of um, revoked visas and so forth? <laughs> Everybody wants to jump in. There's a rush. Uh, thank you for that question. It's a super important question. The, the ability to build a trusting relationship with diaspora communities in the country between those communities and government institutions is, is just critical to our work. Uh, to that end, we engage directly with those communities. I have an advisory board to me directly that helps me understand how we can better work with those communities. Um, the, the work, um, and I think the, the most perfect example of, of what you're asking us about is the recent questions around Chinese police stations in the country where we were able to engage with communities. We were able to do kind of public appeals, post information, post police officers outside of those venues, uh, engage with, with the Chinese diplomats in the country. Th that has effectively stopped the activities of those five police stations. So it is working through the community, working in a public way as best we can. Um, that allows us to uh, resist and to push back against those kinds of foreign interference. Thank you. Mr. Julian, two and a half minutes to yourself. Uh, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I have two questions. First of all, did I correctly understand that it is automatic if there are allegations about criminal activity to go beyond the ele electoral uh, lies? Are, is it automatically referred for investigation? Or is this something that agencies verify themselves before passing it on? Touched on just briefly, which is uh, the impact of Russian state actors. We saw their impact in the 2016 election of Donald Trump uh, in the Brexit referendum the massive subsidies going into the United Kingdom Conservative Party. And that is a scandal that erupted when the report was issued after the Conservatives were re-elected. And of course, uh, we've had uh, concerns raised about the connection, Russian state actors and the convoy uh, groups here in Canada, uh, reported by the National Observer and others. Uh, that a lot of the public telegram channels were created or repurposed to support the Freedom Convoy. To what extent is there an ongoing evaluation of Russian dirty tricks when it comes to our democratic system? And have you seen any, any impacts of this during our election campaign? 
So maybe I can answer one aspect of that, um, and that relates to the RRM, the Rapid Response Mechanism that was established in 2018 um, by Canada in the context of the G7 to ensure that we were monitoring uh, disinformation and other online threats to our democracy. Um, and we've certainly been looking at Russian efforts at disinformation, Chinese and other actors. Uh, so this is something that we monitor on an ongoing basis um, in both English and French media, but also foreign language media, um, because you're absolutely right. This is something we need to monitor very carefully, uh, given its impact on our democracy. First question I asked was whether it was automatic when there are potential violations or infractions according to the intelligence you receive, infractions of the Electoral Act, is it autom are those automatically referred? So, uh, automatic. Um, it, it, the community works together. Uh, the RCMP are part of the, 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 the team that, that looks at this information. So they do, in that sense, have ready access, automatic access to that information. Uh, obviously, the, the, um, the use of that information under the Elections Act or under the criminal law, that has to be considered between the two agencies. Uh, they both have their respective lanes uh, in, in which uh, they need to act. Um, but certainly that information is made readily available to the agencies who would be uh, in needing to know the information. Thank you. And now we'll just finish this round with, um, let's do about three and a half, four minutes to Mr. Culkins. And then we will go to three and a half, four minutes to Mrs. Zahoda. Mr. Calkins. Thank you, Madam Chair. To my question will be for Ms. Thomas. Um, would the Prime Minister ever be briefed, or the Prime Minister's immediate aides ever be briefed on foreign interference without the presence of the National Security and Intelligence Advisor? I, I can't speak to what protocols existed before I uh, became the National Security Advisor. They are not briefed. Uh, on foreign interference by CSIS um, or an outside agency without my being present, or they haven't been to my knowledge unless I happen to be out of town, but then there would be an official there for me. In the event during an election campaign that a political entity lodged a complaint or provided intelligence during the election process that foreign interference was happening in a particular riding, would that information be shared with the Prime Minister? It would not. Where would that information go? Th that information comes from the security cleared member um, of each party that has been discussed in terms of how we, they will uh, interact with the panel, and that information would go to the panel of five and the site team. Thank you very much. I just want to talk a little bit about comment that you made at the Defence Committee in December of 2022 where you said no money was exchanged during the 2019 election and I believe your quote was the news stories that you've read about interference are just that news stories and uh, we have not seen any money going to 11 candidates period. Can you confirm that those were your words before the Defence Committee? Uh, I can't confirm that that was my exact quote but the connection that was being made between 11 candidates and $250,000 um, is inaccurate. So in light of the stories that have come out this week, including those from Robert Fife and Stephen Chase about an illegal donation to the Trudeau Foundation in 2015, do you still feel like your statements from that December are accurate? I still feel that my statements from that statement about that particular situation were accurate. Would you confirm with me that, because you've referred to the uh, NSICOP committee, uh, as a, a mechanism that we can be assured that information is being shared. Can you confirm that a member of NSICOP is not allowed to share information with his or her colleagues or his or her leader? That is the premise of that committee. And that would be your expectation, that information it, would be shared? It would be my expectation. Would an NSICOP report ever be released to the public without going through your office or the Prime Minister's office? Uh, the, the committee's uh, unredacted reports uh, are shared with the Prime Minister and redacted reports are released to the public. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mrs. Sahoda, three minutes to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question is to Ms. Thomas. Uh, 
I understand that CSIS has authorities to disrupt attempts of foreign interference. And uh, while you probably can't get into operational matters, can you explain the types of tools that CSIS has available to disrupt foreign interference? And um, if there's any specifics, I'd like to um, specifically have you mention what those tools are. I don't think those are um, comments that I can make in an open forum. Okay. Um, how about, for example, if CSIS was aware that a foreign official, more specifically someone who works at a consulate trying to interfere in a Canadian election, um, would CSIS have the mandate to respond? Could they, for instance, uh, endeavor to use a tool and um, just go and speak to that official at that consulate? Certainly they can use threat reduction measures, um, which is what they're formally called, to go speak to an individual. And, and they can also um, speak to uh, the person being targeted. Can, can you assure this committee that CSIS endeavours to use the tools, at least even if you can't get into specifics of what those tools are, that they at least endeavour to use those tools if uh, and when they feel that there is a, a need because of foreign intervention, uh, foreign interference? Uh, yes, I can assure this committee that CSIS leans forward and uses the tools at its disposal um, to the fullest extent possible and mandated by law and their act. Um, so, so the instances we've been hearing about in the global news reports, uh, do you feel, to your knowledge, that CSIS did use the tools that they have at their disposal uh, to intervene in these matters? Uh, again, I'm not going to speak about specific cases and uh, jeopardize the work that CSIS does. The director of CSIS has more leeway to answer that question about his specific work than I do. Okay, and I intend to explore those questions with them as well. Thank you. Is that, that it, Mrs. Hoda? Yes. Excellent. Wow. Um, with that, I would like to thank our, our guests for joining us today. Thank you for your time and attention. If there's uh, additional information as has been requested, we look forward to you submitting it to the clerk and we'll share it with all members of the committee. With that, I wish you a really good day and thank you for the good work you do. We will suspend briefly and have the next panel join us. Site briefed the panel on several occasions before, during and after the elections of 2019 and 2021. These briefings ensured panel members had a shared understanding of the threat landscape. Site also provided daily classified intelligence updates, which went to all site task force member organizations and the panel. En plus de fournir l'information. In addition to providing information to the panel, Site was part of the Election Security Coordinating Committee, which brought together members of the security and intelligence community representatives of Elections Canada and the Office of the Commissioner of Canada Elections. This group met on a regular basis to ensure communication flows, exercise responses to potential events, and discuss any potential threats to the electoral process. In that context, site provided regular threat briefings to this group. Of regular briefings site conducted consisted of meetings with representatives from political parties who had been provided secret level security clearances to build awareness of foreign threats to Canada's electoral process and provide any relevant foreign interference information. Site briefed these representatives on several occasions before and during the 2019 and 2021 elections. Meanwhile, uh, throughout the election period, CSE and the Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity provided points of contact to all 16 federal registered political parties for further discussion on cybersecurity challenges related to Canada's democratic process. In so doing, uh, political parties or candidates uh, were provided with points of contact should they encounter any suspicious cyber activity, and CSE designated a quick response uh, point of contact for them. In addition to our contributions through site, CSC has also issued numerous unclassified publications, advice, and guidance to inform Canadians about current trends. I can assure you that all of the site members here take all allegations of foreign interference very seriously. Même si le système électoral... Although Canada's electoral system is strong, foreign interference can threaten the integrity of our institutions, particularly by sowing doubt and undermining confidence in, in the process.
Continue to work within our respective mandates to protect Canadians and raise awareness about the serious threat of foreign interference to our country. Thank you again for the invitation to appear, and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you very much for those comments. We will start with six-minute rounds, starting with Mr. Cooper, followed by Mrs. Romanado, suivi par Madame Normandin. Followed by Ms. Normandin, and then Mr. Julian. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to all of the witnesses for being here. I'm going to ask my first question to Ms. Denham. Uh, a rapid response mechanism, open data analysis, dated September 13th, 2021, entitled, so that would have been at during the 2021 election to provide some context, uh, entitled GE44, Chinese Communist Party social media accounts spreading negative narratives about the Conservative Party of Canada. Uh, this analysis, which uh, we've obtained through access to information that I will table before this committee when I have a translated uh, copy, uh, includes the following key findings. Quote, RRM Canada has observed what may be a Chinese Communist Party CCP information operation that aims to discourage Canadians of Chinese heritage from voting for the Conservative Party of Canada, end of quote. And further, uh, further finding, key finding, is, quote, the narrative has grown in considerable scale, end of quote. Uh, was this analysis shared with the CEIPP election panel? Uh, thank you, Chair, for that question. Microphone on? Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the question and for that report, yes. Um, so in that report, uh, any of the reports that the RRM produced was shared uh, with the panel. Um, what I would like to just note in, in that report, it does say that it may be. Uh, again, what we do is we do open source analytics of the information environment. Thank you very much yeah. for that. Um, around the same time, there was... Uh, disinformation that was tracked on certain Chinese language social media platforms such as WeChat and Weibo and uh, some of that some of the themes uh, included disinformation about then member of parliament Kenny Chu's uh, private members bill uh, around uh, foreign agent registry, and it, it's noted in the Rosenberg uh, report. Um, in, in the face of the key finding, a uh, key finding in the analysis of September 13th, and given additional disinformation about conservative candidates that was being spread on social media platforms, at any point uh, did the task force provide any warnings on any of these Chinese language social media platforms that there was misinformation being spread around to warn the public. So thank you, Chair. So if I understand your question is whether or not any information was shared with the public? Any, any warning, any warning about misinformation or disinformation in the face of the fact that such disinformation had been monitored and identified by the site task force. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. So, as I said, in that report, what we were indicating, what we were noticing was that it could be, that we were, we were seeing amplification. That's what we look for, is artificial amplification of content in the social media landscape. So, we were flagging uh, the reality that there was that amplification, but in that report, we were not able to ascertain whether it was well, directed so, by a foreign and I, government. And I, I don't mean to cut you off, but my time is limited and my question was specific. Was any warning issued to alert the public about disinformation that had been identified? And I would note that, you know, when we talk about, for example, WeChat, there are 600,000 WeChat users in the lower mainland. That's a, a lot of people on WeChat. So it gives uh, an idea of the magnitude to which this disinformation uh, was spreading around uh, throughout uh, the Lower Mainland uh, and uh, causing uh, voters to be 
uh, misled about Mr. Chu and about the Conservative Party. That's a big deal. So was any warning issued, yes or no? I, I, I take it the answer is yes. no, but can you just confirm that? The I'm just going to pause real yeah. quick because I get to do this every so often, but I just did it in the last session, so I think, and I respect that it is your time, Mr. Cooper. We have asked our guests to come, and we have to provide them some opportunity to provide some information as well. So, Ms. Denham, the floor to you. Thank you for the question, Madam Chair. So the role of the RRM is to identify potential tactics or uh, campaigns to amplify information. As well as has been explained, any of that information, our role is also to brief the panel on that information. And the panel then takes consideration of not only information we are seeing, but the full spectrum of information that they're being provided. And it is the panel that then makes a decision. What I can say in this instance just is... To, just to clarify, is, are you saying that it would be up to the panel to make a decision such as issuing a warning? The panel, in terms of the protocol that is in place during the RIP period, it is the, it is the panel that makes the assertion if any public announcement is made. Again, in this instance, what I can say is without an ability to identify it was a foreign entity, Thank you very it much. could you, have been made, amplification made, made from Canadian clear. content. And I want to point ask... Point of order. Uh, well, okay. Mr. Turnbull. Point of order, Madam Well... Uh, I mean, with all due respect to my colleagues here, we're trying to uh, give people the space and time to answer legitimate questions. And we're undertaking a really important discussion. As you've said, Madam Chair, I would really appreciate it if we could uh, give our witnesses the ample time to actually answer the questions instead of talking over them. With the, the hybrid capacity, it's also harder to hear what's happening um, for people who are watching. So I do think we should be mindful of that. Um, I am going to give the floor back to Mr. Cooper. You've got 10 seconds. Okay. Well, I guess my time has expired. Ms. Denham, did you want to just finish the point that you, you were just saying something? Um, just for the purposes of clarity, uh, because of the hybrid nature, as you said, the, the main message here is that, yes, we saw the amplification of content, but we were not able to ascertain if it was from a foreign entity or within domestic sources. And that is our role, is to actually flag what we're seeing uh, for an analysis. Mrs. Romanato, up to six minutes to you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and through you, I'd like to thank the witnesses for being with us today. Uh, my first question is for Mrs. Taib. Um, you mentioned in your opening remarks a little bit of the overview of the task force. Can you uh, confirm when the task force was created? Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much for that question. The task force was created in uh, 2018. So, so based on that, obviously this... Um, coordination was not in place prior to the 2019 election. So previous elections did not have this level of coordination in terms of uh, verifying and monitoring uh, potential uh, interference. Is that correct? Uh, what I would say to that is not, uh, that that's a fair point, not in this particular format. However, the security intelligence agencies that are represented here today uh, have always worked very closely together uh, on foreign interference or any threats to any electoral processes. Uh, what we didn't have in place was the formal arrangement uh, that, w that I spoke about earlier today, uh, which is not to say that the coordination and the collaboration was not already taking place prior to then. Perfect. And as we heard in the previous panel, the, the question of interference or attempts uh, in interference is not something that is new. So I, I, I assume in the creation of the uh, task force, this was really just to formalize, as you said, the, the coordination and sharing of information. You also talked a little bit about the briefings that are provided uh, to a panel of senior public servants who serve on the panel and the political parties. Uh, that participate in this pro process. Could you give us a little uh, a little more information on the types of briefings and the frequency that would have been provided? Uh, yes, indeed. And thank you uh, again, Madam Chair, for that question. Um, uh, I would say, uh, important to note, uh, every briefing was slightly different. Uh, I would say in both the 2019 and 2021 elections, uh, the briefings commenced with what I would call um, an overall threat briefing uh, to provide a lay of the land, to provide um, the political party representatives an expectation of what we generally see in, an, in the security and intelligence community, what we 
view as an ongoing uh, foreign interference in uh, in Canadian society, what it looks like, what are some of the tactics used. Uh, so we would call that a general uh, threat brief, which would uh, have been part of the first brief. And in addition to some other logistics, we would have solicited views from the, the members in terms of um, how often they would like to be briefed, uh, were there any uh, additional considerations they wanted us to be mindful of, uh, and we would introduce ourselves and we would um, uh, walk through any logistics. Um, subsequent briefings uh, happened uh, I would not on uh, an exactly precise regular basis, but I would say uh, every couple of weeks uh, throughout uh, the election campaign. Um, uh, and then uh, so with I would call them a f each in 2019 and in 2021 um, would be uh, a few, uh, you know, three, four, five, let's say, per uh, elect election campaign. But there wasn't a there. I couldn't say that there was a set schedule uh, on both occasions. <clears throat> Perfect. And um, based on the briefings that would have been provided to the ta uh, provided by the task force to senior public servants and on the panel, uh, they determined there was no incident or incidents that would have impacted the integrity of the election. Is that correct? Uh, sorry. Uh, now I'm. I'm maybe. I'm, did I misunderstand your first question? I thought you were asking me about political parties. Is that? I just want to confirm that I answered correctly the first time. Yes, you did. Oh, perfect. Okay, thanks. Uh, sorry, and now yeah, understood. And the panel similarly. Um, so yes, uh, panel. The panel was briefed uh, on a regular frequency uh, by the site uh, task force in both uh, electoral campaigns, uh, and ultimately did not find there to have been information that would reach the threshold uh, required to advise Canadians. Thank you very much. And um, on the previous panel, we heard from Miss um, Thomas, and we heard often about the fact that they are guardians of protected information, that there is a duty to protect uh, national security, um, and the role is to detect, deter, and to counter um, foreign interference. She also mentioned that, obviously, in this forum, we are in, in public, that members of PROC do not have the level of uh, security clearance to be able to uh, receive some of the briefings that for ha perhaps ENSICOP or other uh, um, uh, public servants would have received. Is that accurate? And in, for the sake of our national security, we obviously cannot uh, have this uh, information in the public domain. Would you agree with that? Uh, thank you very much for that uh, excellent question. Indeed, uh, I very much agree with that. Um, Classified information, by its very nature, is is that which is very sensitive. It it uh, could endanger uh, human beings. It could endanger really sensitive um, uh, techniques and tools that are utilized by the by the intelligence community. And revealing uh, sensitive information uh, certainly uh, poses uh, a risk to to Canada and Canadians should uh, that information become available to our adversaries. And one quick question. Obviously, this is an evolving um, threat that uh, what you have may have seen in the 2019 election, what you may see in 2020 and 2021, would it be accurate to say that um, the site task force is constantly evaluating um, the methods that you use in terms of being able to gather this information? Thank you so much. I think that is an excellent question, and and we we have said that uh, on several occasions. The threat environment is challenging. Uh, it is evolving. Uh, that the techniques being used are more sophisticated, and the site uh, task force members continue to meet to discuss those and evolve our techniques and ensure that we can can keep uh, uh, keep pace with those developments. Thank you, Madame Normande. Just six uh, minutes. Ms. Nohanda, you have six minutes. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the, the panel for being here. I'd like to come back to information that I think I understood. So as, once we know there's been a disinformation campaign and the source has been source has been identified, and on top of that, that it's artificially amplified, then that's the threshold that must be reached to uh, warn the population. Is that correct? Um, it's if I understood, to, to make sure that I understood the question, Indeed, we are tracking those trends on a regular basis. Those trends uh, and any information that we have as individual members are briefed to the panel. The panel will make a decision whether that reaches a threshold that requires a public announcement. Perfect. And at this moment,
Very well. And in that case, if we don't have absolute certainty that there was an, art an artificially magnified campaign or that we have certain doubts as to the source of the information, in that case, is there a risk that we cannot make a recommendation that it's time to publish, to to publicly state that there there may be a campaign underway? Did you? Thank you. Um, so I think maybe if I can provide a bit of context into what we're, we've we've heard in this panel has heard a lot about how difficult it is in a disinformation landscape. Um, so what I would say is, you know, we when we look for artificial amplification, we want to understand that landscape. We're continually learning about it. But if we're not able to ascertain that there is a foreign aspect that is behind that, that is, that is uh, pushing that amplification, then from, again, from our perspective, that is not something that we would be focused on. Uh, we want to be very careful that there's also the ability for Canadians to actually be ex fully expressing their uh, opinions, and so we don't look at the national dialogue. We're looking for foreign interference. So when we can't see that, uh, we, don't, we don't focus on that. In that case, is there not a risk that with increasingly specialized technology, we never really be able to ensure that there is either a source of disinformation that is external or that it's being art artificially amplified. We keep going around the protocol and uh, we're never certain enough, it seems, to actually warn the population. So is it really a waste of time to put this such a protocol in place? We judge um, the decision making of the panel members. Uh, from our perspective, uh, you'll hear that we are, are mandated to focus our, our attention on, on uh, foreign interference and foreign influence activities. We don't monitor um, uh, any of us, the uh, uh, internal dialogue of Canadians uh, who have the right to express themselves. Um, Having said that, and, and as Tara had indicated, that we would we would brief the panel, and the the panel could, and and this might be something to ask the panel, um, if they determined that there was uh, sufficient impact, because the the again the the threshold for the for the panel is, does this information threaten Canada's ability to hold a free and fair election? Mm -hmm. uh, I, su I suppose if uh, uh, if they felt that that threshold was met, even in the absence of a foreign interference, they they could choose to do that. Um, I think we are not in a position to, to talk through what their considerations might have been in a particular circumstance, but I hope that answers your question. I'd like to hear your thoughts on the feedback between you and the panel. Was the panel updating you as to the measures they were thinking of taking to counter this disinformation to ensure that uh, the elections were, that elections were was more transparent? Uh, were you being uh, informed of this? The nature of the the discussions with the panel were uh, that our role, at least as site members, was to provide them with the information. Um, certainly, uh, they would have had follow up questions, uh, asking us for updates uh, on, on any information that we would have provided and seeking additional information. Um, but the, the, dis the deliberations of the panel in terms of, of, of uh, any decision making would have been their own and, and we were not involved in those discussions. Okay. So if I'm t do I understand that the panel may have uh, received suggestions about how to ensure that ele the election was transparent and fair? But they didn't ask you any questions about whether those measures would be effective. You didn't get that kind of feedback or back and forth with the panel, did you? The panel is 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 the panel is formulated in the protocol. There are also a committee of of senior uh, officials and deputy ministers, uh, and and part of their responsibility would also be to discuss response options if there was any. Um, information that was presented to them that they felt required a response that was not a public announcement but was some other form of, of response, they, they absolutely uh, had the uh, ability to provide that, that advice or question or, or suggestion or, or initiate that discussion at least. Okay. Uh, with curiosity, with a, bit, a little bit of time I have left, could you tell me how panel members were chosen? Um, 
That would unfortunately not be uh, a question that, that I would be able to answer. Uh, the, the panel was established further to the protocol, which was um, uh, something that was undertaken by PCOs so that would probably be best directed towards them. Merci. Thank you. Je crois, Madame la Présidente. Madam Chair, I believe that uh, my time is up. C'est très bien, merci. Very well, thank you. Six minutes to you. <coughs> thank, you thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Um, Thank you, Madame Tayeb, for being in front of us. I'm going to ask uh, the same question that I asked uh, uh, Ms. Thomas. Uh, you have read, I'm sure, the reports by Robert Fife and Steve, uh, Stephen Chase in the Globe and Mail, Sam Cooper on Global News. You've seen that. Will you acknowledge that they are uh, providing factual information? So I can uh, maybe try and answer that, uh, Madam Chair, uh, through you. Thank you for the question. Uh, today, uh, we're not prepared to uh, validate uh, any of the reporting that's been in the media uh, or the alleged leaks. Okay, let's uh, go further then. The, the allegations um, are uh, criminal in nature. If uh, there are violations that took place of the Canada Elections Act, these are, are serious, serious allegations. Um, my two questions then stemming from that are, are you aware of the uh, identities of the nine Liberal and two Conservative MPs that seem to be involved? Uh, and secondly, uh, what do you do when there is uh, allegations of criminal violations? Where, where do you go? Uh, what do you do in terms of referring that information? So thank you, Madam Chair, through you. Uh, the second part of that question is, easier for me to answer, um, certainly during an election and, and even prior to and, and after an election, uh, the intelligence that's being gathered by the service and, and other agencies is shared with uh, law enforcement, RCMP, uh, the Commissioner of Elections Canada, and there's a process by which um, they have eyes on the intelligence, they're able to assess it, uh, and they're able to come back to us and potentially ask for more information and, um, and to pursue uh, uh, something in, in the law enforcement lane. But that's, that's certainly up to them. And, and as the NSIA uh, pointed out in, in her remarks previously, there are some, some real challenges in that respect in terms of transitioning intelligence into evidence into a law enforcement arena. Um, so it, it, is it automatic that any allegations of criminal violation of the Canada Elections Act, such as we saw in the in and out scandal during the Harper government, uh, Dean Del Mastro, former Conservative MP, is it automatic that those allegations are investigated either by the panel uh, or uh, referred automatically to law enforcement or to the Commissioner of Elections? So uh, automatic, I don't think I would use that term. Certainly speaking for the service, when we receive information that points to uh, foreign interference, we will investigate it. Uh, that, that, is, that is a certainty. Um, as I said, our law enforcement partners uh, would be exposed to uh, the fruits of such an intelligence investigation at a, at a high level. And there would be opportunity there potentially uh, to pursue uh, a criminal investigation. But you know there are there are different thresholds in in uh, the law enforcement world and, and the criminal wo world. Uh, so to say that that anything would be automatic, uh, I think uh, would would be incorrect. So you would investigate it further to see if the financial transactions violate the Canada Elections Act. So we would not be investigating it through the lens of the criminal code or crimes. We would be looking for foreign interference, which is defined in our act as uh, deceptive um, activity on the part of a foreign state that is uh, detrimental to Canadian interests. So that's our threshold. It's a lower threshold than law enforcement, and uh, we would certainly investigate uh, any any credible information that pointed to uh, foreign interference. I can't speak to um, what would be required in, in a law enforcement space uh, in terms of pursuing a, a criminal investigation. 
um, uh, that that is concerning to me in the sense that uh, obviously a financial impropriety that violates the Canada Elections Act may not be something that comes to light until after uh, that particular candidate has filed. Uh, but I've 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 pushed the question enough. I, I haven't had a satisfactory answer. But I'll, I'll move on. I I did ask you if the panel was aware of the identities of the nine. Liberal, two Conservative MPs that are uh, referenced as uh, Beijing uh, viewing them favorably in the reports. And I'm not asking for their names, of course. I'm just asking, are you aware? Again, Madam Chair, uh, I won't be commenting on on any reporting uh, or alleged uh, media leaks. Uh, I will then go on to my next question. Uh, and that is around, and this is back to Madame uh, Tayeb. Uh, you referenced a threshold in terms of information and uh, the panel determining that threshold on a national basis. But we know that disinformation can have an impact at the riding uh, level. And so does the panel evaluate the impacts on a riding to riding basis as well? Uh, because something that might not hit the national threshold might have an impact at the riding level. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, for that question. Uh, I can speak from a site task force perspective. We uh, would have been uh, monitoring uh, and reporting and briefing on any threats. Uh, we don't make a distinction uh, necessarily between a riding level and a federal level. Uh, but in terms of the panel's considerations, I would have to uh, defer to, uh, to the panel members who I believe are appearing uh, at a later date. Thank you. Mr. Cooper. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, uh, to whoever is, can answer the, the question. Having regard for the caretaker convention or otherwise, did the task force uh, go back and seek the input from the Prime Minister or any uh, minister in the government uh, during the 2021 election writ period? Thank you very much for that question. Uh, I can I can take that one. The site uh, task force, uh, as I indicated in my opening remarks, had uh, was responsible for writing briefings, and I outlined the three sets of briefings that we were responsible for for doing: um, one to the panel, uh, one to the political party representatives, and another one, the third, uh, to the election security um, uh, communication or, or co coordinating committee. Um, but otherwise, we did not separately brief uh, the prime minister or any ministers. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I would just like to note that your French language opening remarks were excellent. So if we could uh, speak in French, uh, that would be great. I'm not going to talk about media reporting. I'm going to talk about documents. Have any of you seen documents uh, testifying to the existence of a well-oiled machine active in Canada with two main objectives? to ensure the re-election of a Liberal minority government in 2021 and to ensure the defeat of certain Conservative candidates identified by the Chinese Communist Party. Did any of you see such a document? Well, that's the problem. Every time we ask a, a precise question, every time we ask a question about a subject that might actually clarify things for us, it turns out the answer is classified. If I understand correctly, you have said that you report to political party representatives uh, who are clear to receive certain information. We, oui, oui. Yes, that's the case. So when they're cleared, you, when you're cleared, you can't share information you gain through those sessions. Yes, that's correct. The info you give to political party, uh, representatives of political parties cannot be shared. So the only open door is the panel. You report to the panel. You take the information that you gather and give it to the panel, but the information itself cannot otherwise be made public. Thank you for that question. That's true. 
and I understand that this could be a frustrating process. Answer to that, uh, we do try very hard to uh, all of us uh, who have been talking about foreign interference uh, for a good amount of time uh, in the public, we try to be as transparent uh, as possible. But mais, in mais this vous pas l'être, Madame. But you can't be transparent. I'm sorry to cut you off. You want to be transparent, but you can't be transparent. And that's what's so frustrating for political parties. We know that the information is out there, but it can't be shared. You talked about a process. Every time I hear the word process, I think of a long-term process. But an election only lasts maybe 30, 45 days. So what's the point of sight if it cannot act on the information it receives during the election? And I, I completely understand uh, that point of view, um, having been a practitioner in the security intelligence community for for um, almost 25 years, it is a careful balance that we deal with every day. We, we, we definitely are attempting to put more information in the public about what we're seeing, about the threat of foreign interference, about the types of techniques that are used. Um, and, and this, what we're seeing today and the creation of the panel was a function of, of trying si, to do a better job at that. Mais, mais qui décide, là? But then, if you realize there's uh, disinformation on social media. That's already in the public sphere. Anyone can go out and see that this disinformation. So at what point does uh, at what point does uh, this become a secret for sight? Madam Chair, if I could uh, perhaps add to that. I think there's sort of this difference between intelligence and being able to speak to intelligence that would have been shared with cleared political party members uh, and briefed accordingly, and then your question related to disinformation specifically, right? So the RRM actually works on open source information, and those reports uh, were shared with the panel, and then after the election, we have done an annual RRM report. But that is because, what again, what we're driving for is that we can actually understand the tactics that we're seeing. We work with our G7 colleagues to understand what they're seeing, and we share that. The reason it wasn't shared during an election period, and again, the panel gives the opportunity that it could be shared in the instance that we feel that the panel feels that it actually could impact the integrity of the election. And what we've oh, cool. but what, well, it, inaudible, but apparently it's a process. That is what the, the panel and the protocol is about, is to actually protect the elections at the time uh, and for the last two elections based on the information that was shared with the panel. At no time did it reach a threshold that it... Uh, not, not your threshold. Okay. The threshold Sorry, the I was trying to be good and then it continued, so there's definitely... Uh, we were waiting for you to stop it. Oh, you were waiting? <laughs> Mr. Bertold, that means a lot to me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. O'Connell, up to five minutes for you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, everyone, for appearing. Um, I want to follow up with a question that was asked in the first panel by my colleague. Um, there have been allegations made by Walid Solomon, who was the representative for the Conservative Party. Um, he alleged that he had raised, on behalf of the Conservative Party, um, to cite in 2021 concerns about election or foreign interference in the election. And he claimed that his concerns were not taken seriously. We heard from the national security um, advisor who said that there was a lengthy response, but could somebody here speak to that, uh, those allegations? And can you speak to when specifically Mr. Solomon brought forward uh, these allegations to cite? Uh, Madam Chair, um, I can't speak to the specifics, uh, I'm afraid, of those allegations. I can assure uh, the committee certainly that when uh, allegations of foreign influence activity are brought, brought to site or brought to the service, uh, they're taken seriously, uh, they're looked at, um, and uh, if necessary, they, they'd be acted upon. But I can't, I can't speak uh, specifically to any, any uh, case or, or instance. But can you speak to the fact that these specific allegations were responded to? 
No, I can't. I'm sorry. I know that the NSIA went a little further than, than I'm prepared to go, but uh, I can't speak to specifics. Okay, thank you. I want to get back to um, the issues around the balance. And there's a lot of kind of conflation. And Ms. Denham, I think you keep trying to speak to this, but then it's getting cut off. And I would like to hear the the answers. But this balance or the suggestion about disinformation is out there. I mean, we can certainly see that. But isn't the distinction and the point of sight is to make sure that dis it's the disinformation being pushed by foreign state actors as a form of foreign interference to take away Canadians' determination. But frankly, as politicians, I'm sure we've all seen in campaigns disinformation from from you know various sources. But your threshold and the and the piece you were speaking about and what site is responsible for is not all disinformation that's out there. And certainly not all disinformation that even it might be shared amongst some groups or other groups, but it's specific around foreign interference and that site did not see that threshold met, that it was that the origins were those foreign state actors. Thank you for that question. Um, so yes, you are correct that for the RRM, which is a member of SITE, uh, and again, being able to look at that open source environment, we are looking for th tactics, amplification that we may see, artificial amplification of content that we can ascertain uh, has a link to a foreign entity. Um, again, that's what, what our focus is. And as you say, uh, and as I've mentioned, in these instances, we were observing some amplification of content um, and we were shedding light on any particular information we could have in terms of sources, but we were not able to ascertain if it was coming from a foreign entity or within Canada. I think I might just add there that, I mean, this information landscape is really complex. You're absolutely correct that it's uh, sometimes very hard to tell, and that's been mentioned already. Um, but the RRM also, from, from when we started this work, established uh, an ethical and methodological framework that guides how we look at that information space so that we can be really clear that we are looking for foreign uh, foreign entities aiming to amplify that content without interfering or having any say as to the ability for Canadians to engage freely. And you're absolutely correct that the, those sources of information could be coming from Canadians or, or other uh, welcome debate. Thank you. And since the, or the 2019 election to the 2021 election, for example, Jim Judge did a report and he appeared before a committee and it's my understanding that there would be recommendations, for example, that would have reviewed um, site and the process. And again, uh, hearing some of the questions around that process, were there changes made from 2019 with the site protocol and this whole protocol to the 2021 election based on Mr. Judge or other observations of how this was working? Did somebody want to respond quickly? Um, thank you very much for that question. Um, the, the main uh, changes I understand, and I think I encourage you to ask this question of uh, PCO when they're here, because they were responsible for, for um, uh, changing uh, uh, elements of the protocol. From a site perspective, our mandates remain the same. Uh, we, we don't, uh, you know, we keep to, to, uh, to we adhere to the mandates and the, and the authorities that, that we have. So from a composition perspective, uh, that didn't change. From a, a protocol perspective, I understand there were changes that, that I would encourage uh, PCO to speak to tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Madame Normandin, two minutes. Ms. Normandin, two and a half minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. First, I'm going to take 20 seconds to put in place a notice of motion. It will be sent to the chair. It's, this calls for the House to call upon the government to launch an independent public investigation of Chinese interference in Canadian demo, uh, democratic processes. And uh, it, this should be subject to an agreement between recognized parties. Now I want to talk about the threshold. I understand that it's easier to reach the threshold when it's a, a large scope operation. 
and harder when it's at the riding level. It seems to me that uh, riding level operations would uh, have be less likely to reach the threshold to inform the public. Now, there's a risk in this, and they're not. If there were all sorts of small local uh, interference operations, uh, it might get around the protocol. Um, I think uh, I would address the following, and I, I might have, have alluded to this earlier, that as members of the site task force, we are looking at uh, instances of, of threats to the elections, particularly from foreign interference. Um, and we wouldn't make that distinction in, in the reporting that we would provide uh, to the panel. Um, how the panel views that question, though, uh, would probably be best addressed uh, to them. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Let's say p there are um, allegations provided to you concerning potential candidates. Do you then go to the candidates and uh, talk about uh, the allegations hanging over them? Merci beaucoup, uh, well Thank you for that question. It's an excellent question. Um, working of the site uh, and uh, the way that the site worked with the political party is that we did provide uh, threat overviews. Um, we provided information that was relevant to all parties. Where there would have been specific uh, information uh, to, to provide to a particular party on a particular incident, uh, the site endeavored to have separate meetings with those uh, parties, mm -hmm. sensitive issues, um, and that would be with the, the, ag the site agency that was, um, or a site department that was uh, responsible for that uh, particular incident. Est-ce que c'est une décision qui émanait de... Now, who makes the decision? You or the panel? Uh, who would decide whether to go up to a candidate and inform them of uh, interference in their riding? Uh, maybe just to clarify, um, in, in my answer, I was talking about the cleared political party representatives. Uh, maybe you're asking about the, the individual uh, uh, affected by that. I might ask my colleague to, uh, to answer that. Yeah, absolutely, uh, Madam Chair, through you. So there, there is a provision with, within the protocol that allows uh, for um, outreach to an individual who we think is being targeted by foreign influence activity. Uh, my understanding is, is that decision can be taken by the deputy head of, of the agency, but I, I stand to be corrected on that. Um, Thank you. Do you want to finish your thought? Sorry. I just, we didn't put the timer on, so we went over, and I just, somebody might be timing this online so and being like, oh, it's gone over. Mr. Julian, two and a half minutes. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I. Uh, Madam Tayeb, I just want to come back uh, to your comments um, about the the impact on local constituencies. You said we wouldn't make that distinction about something that could potentially have an impact at the constituency level. And so the information would be referred to the panel. But how would the panel be aware that this is potentially information that could be election determining or have an impact on the election at the local riding level? Uh, thank you very much uh, for that question um, and allowing me the opportunity to, to clarify. I think what I was intending to say is that uh, from, from the agencies represented here, uh, we reported any threat we saw uh, to the panel. Uh, so whether it was uh, anything that we would have seen locally or that we would have seen at a national uh, level. So all of that information would go to the panel. Insofar as how the panel makes their determination, I really have to defer to... Uh, to the members of the panel to uh, to explain that. Okay. Uh, my last question is, you talked about amplification of information, and we know that there were allegations surrounding Chinese agents. We also know that there was uh, there were many allegations of Russian interference. We saw this with Trump's election in 2016, with uh, the Brexit referendum in the UK. Also, uh, funding for the British Conservative Party, they were funded uh, directly by the Russians. Furthermore, there were allegations of uh, Russian interference in, uh, in the Freedom Convoy, the so-called Freedom Convoy. Now, 
when you look at uh, Chinese and Russian interference, how do we go about protecting ourselves from Chinese or Russian interference? Perhaps uh, I can start, Madam Chair, and, and others can add as appropriate. Um, what I would say is you're right in, in ascertaining the impact uh, can be challenging, but I think what this uh, committee has heard is that we understand that there is a for intent by many countries to interfere uh, and that we really take it seriously to, to do everything we can to address that. A lot of the roles that we play is to actually understand what those threat vectors look like. Uh, and so it's constantly trying to learn. Uh, I can speak for the RRM. That's part of what we contribute is we're trying to understand what that threat looks like against Canada. But as you said, there's examples internationally, um, and the RRM aims to share that information. So again, it's that focus on continually learning what the threat looks like. Uh, it's very difficult to ascertain impact, uh, but we know there is intent. Thank you. Mr. Culkins, four minutes to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in the 2019 or 2021 election, has the public ever been informed of foreign interference in any media platform um, during an election? Ever? Has there ever been a warning or has the public been advised or an advisory in either of those elections? Yes or no? Thank you very much for that question. Uh, in so far as it relates to the activities of the panel and the public uh, announcement uh, function that they would render, should they deem required, I that the answer to that question is no. Nothing has met the threshold or test yet for a, for the public to know. Um, in the discussion of amplifications, uh, Ms. Denham, you said that. Uh, you've witnessed amplifications of information or chatter, or whatever the lingo happens to be, and you said that you could not confirm that it was foreign interference. That also implies that you cannot deny there was foreign interference. Would you agree with my statement? I wouldn't agree with the premise of that. I think it's really important when you're talking about disinformation and the source of it. Uh, just because we aren't able to fully confirm it's a foreign entity, um, I think it's, as I said, it's really important. It could be Canadians, it could be other entities having conversations, so I wouldn't want to apply, imply that that means it is, it is not foreign, that it's the counter. You can't confirm something, you can't deny something, is, is, a, is a very logical argument. And I want to just get you to clarify a statement that you have just made in your testimony here today. You, through one of your answers, you said, we cannot tell if it's foreign or from within Canada. So is your definition of foreign interference have to come from offshore, and if it happens within the territorial confines of Canada, it's not considered foreign. Is that your, is, that's how I interpreted your comment. Uh, is that how you operate? No, and thank you for that question, uh, Madam Chair, to clarify in what, uh, what I meant to uh, say. What we look for are those tactics, and when I say that we couldn't confirm it w if it was a foreign entity, it could be a foreign entity that is using proxies in different ways to amplify the content, but you need to find the link back to a foreign entity that's directing that. And so, uh, just to clarify uh, that statement. Thank you so much. Uh, your responsibility is to monitor elections, but your responsibility would not extend to nomination races and leadership races. Is that correct? The RRM's mandate specifically is threats to uh, democracies, actually, uh, foreign threats to democracies. Uh, and so we look at the, the threat landscape more broadly, uh, but perhaps Mr. Fisher would like to add. Sure, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I mean, certainly from a, a service uh, perspective and, and mandate, any foreign influence activity is something we would be interested in and would investigate, and that would extend to potentially uh, nominations, party nominations, uh, outside of an uh, of a electoral writ. There has also been numerous conversations about turning intelligence into evidence. I think the Canadian public broadly accepts that there has been significant foreign interference in our democratic processes 
and not a single individual has been hauled to the bar to account for any of this. There have been no charges laid by the RCMP. There has been no charges, to my knowledge, that have been uh, put forward by Elections Canada. Um, so where is the missing gap in turning intelligence into evidence so that we can actually prosecute those who the Canadian public broadly accepts are acting with impunity in our democratic processes? So uh, thank you for the question. It, it's a very good one. It's something uh, I would suggest the government has been wrestling with uh, for some time now. Um, and it's not just in Canada. It's, it's uh, an issue that all of our allies face in terms of trying to find a way to transition intelligence into evidence. It's ultimately a policy development and probably a legislative fix that would be required in that space, but that's well uh, beyond uh, my remit. And, and I know uh, our colleagues at uh, uh, Public Safety uh, certainly have this on their plate as, as something they've been, they've been looking at and studying. Thank you. Mr. Fergus, I'll give you the same four minutes as Mr. Calkins. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will attempt to be brief. The uh, uncomfortable question, so let me just get right into it. Uh, a national security expert, uh, Jessica Davis, uh, she had tweeted, and I quote, the leaks are a big concern for me. They appear quite partisan in nature. This might be the nature of interference in their targets. It might be about a function of the reporting, or it might be selective leaking. We need to be very careful about considering the leaked information in context. We should probably all be paying a lot more attention to what's going on in committee when public officials are testifying. They're in a position to give better context. What would be your reaction to that comment? Well, my, my reaction as uh, an intelligence professional and uh, an employee of the service, speaking just generally of leaked intelligence, is that it's something we take extremely seriously. Um, obviously, protecting our sources, our operations, our trade craft is uh, essential to being able to conduct our investigations and do our business. Uh, anything that puts that at risk is something uh, that we take extremely seriously. Thank you. For two elections now, site has existed. Um, does the intelligence community have the resources it needs to counter uh, these examples or concerns of potential foreign interference? I can, I can start that off, but I'll turn to my colleagues because we each, uh, and, and thank you very much for that excellent question, we each have uh, a number of tools and authorities uh, available to us. Uh, from a, a, a CSE perspective, uh, we certainly have a foreign intelligence mandate, so we collect foreign intelligence. We have the ability to protect, uh, for our cyber defense mandate, we have the ability to protect Canadian government systems uh, and, and other critical infrastructure systems. We also have uh, author new authorities that allow us to take action to disrupt uh, threat-related uh, activities uh, from foreign threat actors. So from a CSE perspective, we feel that we have uh, the tools necessary uh, to counteract this. We do we do utilize uh, these authorities uh, in all aspects of foreign interference, and so I wanted to uh, affirm that to the committee. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, and I, I can add just from a, a service perspective, uh, I mean, in terms of resources, I, I think we we face the reality any organization does. We have to operate within, within the resources we're allocated. And certainly as the threat environment changes, uh, we need to respond to that. And we've done that certainly to uh, meet the threats that are, that are developing and, and uh, evolving. Uh, I'd probably say that in terms of tools, and it's been said before, I think, in, in front of this committee, um, the technology is is uh, evolving faster, I think, than than our act has been able to keep up. Uh, we need to be able to do more data driven investigations, and uh, that that is a difficulty uh, for us. So certainly, in terms of tools and improvements um, for the service, that that's something that would make a difference. I have about forty seconds left, so we're going to have to split this time pretty quickly. Um, in your answer to uh, Mr. Calkins' question about the problem that countries are facing, or that you, in your answer, talked about countries are facing around the world in terms of the intelligence to evidence uh, problem, uh, what type of legislative uh, tools are you imagining could be useful, or that is being discussed with your colleagues around the world? 
I'm sorry, Madam Chair, that, that really is outside of, uh, of my remit and, and uh, I, I'd probably refer you to uh, the Department of Public Safety where um, I have colleagues that, that have been looking at this issue for some time. Excellent. With that, I would like to um, thank our witnesses, our guests, for taking the time to join us today. We'd like to thank you for your service and uh, being available. If there's any additional information you'd like to provide, please do share it with the clerk, and the clerk will ensure that all members receive that information. I will, uh, on behalf of members, thank you and your teams for your time uh, and your service once again. For committee members, whether in person or online, I'm going to su suspend for 10 minutes and we will return um, to the conversation that was at the top of this meeting. So 10 minutes, we will see you back at 5.22. Thank you. <laughs>